All right, hello everyone. Uh, the title of this talk is uh, Did Kubernetes Make My P95s Worse? Um, quick show of hand, how many of you think the answer is yes? All right, cool, that's, that's like half of you. Um, who are we? Hi, I'm, I, I'm Jin. Um, I'm on the service orchestration team at Airbnb and we provide tools and guidance for engineers to configure and operate services at scale. Did you start on? Yeah. Uh, so I work on the uh, compute infra team at Airbnb, so manage uh, scaling, uh, maintaining uh, our Kubernetes clusters. Okay. So here's a, a quick outline of what we're going to go through today. So we're going to start with a brief introduction about our, our migration story. Hello, awesome. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So we're gonna start with an uh, introduction of uh, how we migrated uh, Kubernetes onto Kubernetes at Airbnb. Then we'll dive into some specific interesting cases of uh, potential performance regressions on the services that we migrated. And finally, we'll go through some of the lessons. Okay, so uh, this is mostly about Kubernetes, but also a little bit about containers at Airbnb. So uh, to set some context, uh, we had a lot of services that used to be running on uh, EC2 uh, on their own individual instances. Uh, so when we migrated onto Kubernetes, we migrated onto both containers and Kubernetes. So that I'll play out in, in some of the uh, specific examples. So here's a, a graph of our migration. Um, so production migration started in earnest in the start of 2018. And as of September 2019, we're at around, uh, looks like a thousand services here. Uh, so we've, we've seen a lot of migrations uh, and got a few interesting cases. And here's a little detail, a few details about our environment that'll come out later. So we're running on uh, Amazon Linux 2 on our um, Minion instances. Uh, we're running Ubuntu images. And we're, for our CNI plugin, we're using Canal, which is a combination of Calico and flana uh, Flannel. Uh, we're making pretty heavy usage of no port services as a integration point with our uh, in-house service discovery system, SmartStack. And for our specific application services, uh, we've got many different languages. A lot of them are in uh, Ruby and Java, but we also got uh, Python and Go. All right, I'm gonna t start talking about the problems then. Um, so during this graph, right, uh, there were both that lots of new services created in Kubernetes and containers first, but there were also a lot of migrations from EC2, and those are more of the interesting problems because we actually have something for side-by-side -side comparison. Because um, during that time, we would actually start getting questions from our um, service developers asking like, hey, why do I have latency, latency issues with like one specific pod, or why is my latency issue uh, getting worse after I do a migration? And we get more questions about latency and why things are slow and just more latency issues and even more latency issues. And this makes us sad because like things are slow and uh, they're asking infra engineers like, hey, help us, what's happening? Uh, this migration is like, seems like it's not going so well. But let's actually dive into the actual problems. Uh, let's talk about a case where actually it seems like latencies might have improved. Here is a graph where uh, during the migration, latencies were kind of like went down actually when they were doing a side by side, when they had a side by side deployment. And actually, when they fully deployed, uh, latencies just like dramatically got better. So, what happened here? Uh, well, what do you know about the service? Uh, it migrated from EC2 to Kubernetes plus containers. There were no code changes, roughly the same amount of CPU and memory. It was a Java service. Latency dramatically improved, and the service was also spun up in early 2018. 
for us, the biggest clue was that the fact that this service was spun up in early 2018. Uh, when we actually dug into it, uh, this was actually a very common issue or a, co a common uh, nice surprise. Uh, the service was actually running on previous generation's hardware. So the migration just so happened to have also upgraded the service's hardware. And this is like one quote where the guy was like, wow, it's just a better box with faster network and it's cheaper. Uh, we've also seen cases where things got slower because they were on like super beefy hardware and now we've just kind of like moved them into our cluster where we have like one type of hardware. And for this example, the question is like, did Kubernetes make my P95s better? Uh, I would say no, <laughs> but we will tell our customers yes if it got better. <laughs> um, and I say this because I think hardware choices have to be made anyways, and usually instance types aren't intentionally picked to match the application. Usually uh, the hardware is just like chosen in the beginning and people just like kind of forget about it later on. Uh, the lessons here are like th th the things that apps can be running on can be different for better or worse. So one example here is hardware, right? They could have old, older hardware or even better hardware and now this migration just so happens to have also changed that. Um, other things that might get you are like the host operating system because um, when your service was running on its own box, it might have some OS, but now all your Kubernetes uh, hosts and minions are running on, might, might be running on a different operating system. All right, now I'm gonna talk about the problem of uh, noisy neighbors. Um, we've seen this case where sometimes it's only certain pods. So for a service, they have like many, many pods, and it just so happens like two or three of these pods have extra high latency. We've also seen this issue where latency, they were running on Kubernetes fine for multiple days and suddenly uh, their latencies went up and it just happened, that became the new normal. And then sometimes it becomes an incident where there's like a sharp spike in all of our pods and they all have latency problems. So what happened here? Um, the hint is, it's in the title, uh, is noisy neighbors. Uh, and the explanation of noisy neighbors is uh, the idea that you, know, you have multiple containers or apps or processes and they're all sharing the resources of a computer and there's only so much CPU to go around. Uh, in this little example, you know, we have like three services, like a uh, uh, green, blue, and orange one and the green one's like definitely dominating the CPU time and we can say like this green noisy service, green, this green noisy service is, is just, like, just like taking up all the CPU time so the blue and orange one is just not getting scheduled. Uh, let's call this green service uh, service kale. So in this case, we actually learned uh, sometimes when certain pods, it was specifically pods that were co-located with a service kale. And when it became constant, it was actually the same service, service kale, that migrated to the same cluster. Um, this, this also made issues where people were like, well, can I get off this cluster because this is no longer a good cluster? Uh, we tell them no. Um, and in this case where it became an incident, it actually was not service kill, this was just us accidentally deploying a staging service uh, to, to the wrong cluster and it just like got deployed to the uh, pr production cluster and just took up all the CPU. And now some of you are thinking, how can this be a problem? Like where is the isolation? Uh, well, in the early days of Airbnb and Kubernetes, we actually decided not to set CPU limits because it seemed to have hurt performance. Um, I, I would say that's a bad choice and we, we don't recommend it. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you do not set limits? Just like one of you, a few of you, okay. Uh, I can see there being some use cases if you don't have a latency or performance sensitive uh, applications running on your cluster, but in general, it's like, I, I would not recommend it because now, now it's a problem for us. And you think the fix is easy and simple, right? Like you just add the CPU limits. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, so in this example, let's say you have a CPU uh, request and limit of like 10 uh, millicores. Uh, so the idea is like, how do you spend your 10 CPU quota? Well, there's this thing, there's an the idea like you have a CPU CF CFS quota of 100 milliseconds and you can use your 10 uh, millicores up within this 100 milliseconds. And in the first case, you could use it all up in like the first 20 milliseconds, 
but then you'd be throttled for the next 80, sec 80 milliseconds. Uh, and then in the second case, maybe your CPU is actually like spread out over the whole 100 milliseconds, and your application will actually be fine. And this matters because in most of our use cases, um, our metrics collector would just show similar CPU or low CPU utilization. But we would have really fine-grained hotspots where services would just use up all of their CPU and then just get throttled. So this means uh, most metrics collectors, um, it's really hard to detect fine-grained hotspots. Uh, some things we've tried were changing like CFS quota. It didn't help in our case. We Second thing we tried was uh, more CPU allocation and using a more finer grain CPU metrics collector. That was really useful because we were able to actually see like, hey, this service will show like really low util utilization of a CPU request, but when we got the fine grain metrics, we actually see all the spikes happening. And three, uh, we actually set CPU limits now. Um, other things we were actually looking into is like CPU pinning or CPU sets um, or CPU managers. There, but for us, uh, we found some open issues that didn't work with it for us. Uh, it's, it's funny, uh, actually most of these open issues got, there, there were recent movements like in the last two weeks, so I think that's like a coupon effect. So we're just like finishing all the open issues. Um, so in this case, uh, let's say the question is like, did Kubernetes make my P95s worse? And I would say yes because uh, multi-tenancy is awesome, but it's hard to not take some performance hits from it. And before, applications were running on their own dedicated boxes, but now they're kind of sharing all the resources with other strange applications. And the lessons here are containers should be contained, and we recommend uh, setting resource limits upfront. Okay, so this is a continuation of noisy neighbors made slightly worse by Kubernetes. Uh, so here's a graph of a somewhat large service that we have. Uh, and one day it decided to go from you know, about 600 pods and scaled up to a little over 1,000. Right? So um, auto scaling is working, that's great. Um, and then on some of our hosts, we saw uh, you know, no idle CPU, CPU contention. Uh, but in aggregate, uh, the load was fine, right? Like the overall CPU utilization was just around 50%. So again, auto scaling is working great. Uh, so we dug into it a little deeper. Uh, we found 18 identical service pods running on a single host. And, and for context, like this was not a small cluster by any means. So we weren't trying to cram a ton of uh, pods. So this was an unexpected result for us. So. Why did this happen? So we're, we're going to go a little bit into the scheduler and um, talk about uh, some of those features. So uh, at a high level, uh, scheduler is broken down into kind of two uh, logical sets of components. One is like filters, which explain where your pod can or cannot run or must or must not run. Uh, so some examples of filters are resources. So like if your node has like 10 CPUs, it's already been filled up with like nine requests. It can only fit at max like one additional CPU, right? Simple. Uh, and then f there's also a uh, topology. So um, if your service ha uh, pods have a like required affinity to a certain like AZ or a certain node, uh, and then uh, other kinds of uh, like anti-pod affinity. And then uh, after filtering, uh, there's scoring of the re remaining eligible nodes, right? Which is kind of saying where should my pod run or where should it not run? So some examples of that are uh, preferred affinity, uh, spreading by topology. So like if you're running a cluster in multiple AZs, which is what we do, uh, it will try to spread uh, pods evenly across multiple AZs and spread them evenly across multiple nodes. Uh, finally, there's one, uh, scoring priority that's called image locality, right? So that one basically says, if you've already downloaded an image onto one minion node, it's, your pods are more likely to schedule onto that minion node. And the idea is usually to um, have all of these priorities kind of counterbalance each other and offer like a reasonable compromise. But in our case, um, 
that services uh, had one gigantic image, uh, so image locality was really outweighing all the other priorities. Uh, so basically the, the tendency was just to pile up on one single node. Uh, and to make things a little bit worse, um, this service was also not doing its uh, requests and, and limits quite, quite correctly. Uh, it was using more than its requested CPU and it, it didn't have any limits. So yeah, so back to the, the question, did Kubernetes make my P95s worse? Uh, definitely yes, in this case. Um, so the lessons here are that the scheduler can work against you uh, in some pathological cases, for example, like if you have really large images. Um, and something that we're interested in trying is the uh, pod topology spread constraints to limit exactly how many pods we can run uh, per node, per AZ, um, but we haven't tried it yet. Okay, some more lessons. Um, one thing to mention here is like, we didn't quite get into is like, why was, um, why was CPU and aggregate so good? Why was it like evenly spread at 50% and like some hosts were totally starved of CPU? Uh, so we'll get into this a little more later, but uh, basically Kubernetes services can cause traffic imbalance when you're using like the IB tables proxier. Uh, and also another lesson is that autoscaling uses the average CPU across all pods. So this can even cause some pathological behavior. For example, if some of your pods are, let's say unreachable, then uh, the aggregate CPU will drop and then Autoscaler will scale down the uh, deployment further and then maybe more pods will become unavailable. But uh, we haven't gotten to that one uh, in this presentation. All right, now we're gonna talk about use case of uh, write once, run anywhere. Um, this was a Stack Overflow, internal Stack Overflow post where it's like, hey, my latency uh, got worse. But the key point is this is a Java application. P95s went from like 30 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, P99s uh, 3, uh, 2x. And it was specifically only for DB connections, so not their service to service connections. Uh, here's a close up graph of like what happened with the latency. And this is really mysterious for us because like we're probably 100 service, service migrations deep. Um, all other services seem to be uh, running steady and fine. And we're thinking, all right, this is probably just another misconfiguration by the application. But this is indeed interesting because it's only DB connections. It's, it's not like other, it's not service to service connections. Um, when we actually dug into it, the problem was we learned that for a specific endpoint when connecting to uh, databases, we had created a new thread pool per request. And when we actually fixed it by reusing a thread pool in a static context, it did fix the performance issues. But the question is still, why did this work before Kubernetes? And let's go back to explaining like how Java services work. Like if you were running a Java application in a, in a node all by itself, uh, the JVM might tell your application, hey, I have like 36 CPUs, like that's great. Um, now you like put it in a pod, this still works. But I stole this slide from my colleague. <laughs> uh, the, but now if you have like three of these pods all running on the same node, each of them think they have uh, 36 CPUs. And this is a problem. Because uh, that's how uh, Java kind of tunes itself. Um, so this is actually a, was an open bug. Uh, older versions of Java just were just not container aware. And this is important because Java tunes itself based on how much resources, like CPU cores, it thinks the system has. Uh, and it affects things like uh, how thread pools work. Uh, this is fixed in a Java version, uh, and there are lots of posts on this if you just Google for it. So for us, uh, when we actually like uh, moved to the new JVM, performance did dramatically improve. We also tried like this um, other flag, but it didn't have much of an, of an effect. So, so here the question is like, did Kubernetes make, make my performance worse? And the answer I would say is yes. Because the container's promise of build once, run anywhere isn't 100% accurate. Uh, languages and applications can have deeper dependencies on the underlying systems that they run on. And uh, some of you might say like, well this is more containers, not Kubernetes. But for us, uh, we consider it all as like one whole ecosystem during the migration. Like moving from raw, moving from applications on like raw uh, host nodes 
to uh, containers and Kubernetes. And so the lessons here are, yeah, you, uh, languages and applications have deeper dependencies on the underly underlying systems. You should upgrade your system to be more container aware. And for us, I would say we were very lucky that we had a migration uh, because having a baseline can be very enlightening. Lots of services were actually created in Kubernetes uh, first, and, they, and this meant like they were blissfully unaware of the performance gains to be have, to be like have. Uh, because we had this mi migration, we like realized this is a performance problem, and then we were able to like tell all of our Java applications, "Hey, upgrade it," and you might just see a dramatic uh, performance uh, improvement. Okay, so now I'm going to get a little bit more into uh, traffic imbalance details, uh, the horrors of IP tables. Okay, so this is one, uh, another question from uh, internal stack overflow. Uh, it says, uh, this service has a lot of pods. Sometimes uh, some pods have a markedly different QPS distribution. You can see that uh, on the top graph, um, some pods seem to have double the QPS of uh, other pods. And of course, that means they have higher latencies. So let's get an, a little bit into um, the details of how uh, Kubernetes services work. So like I said earlier, uh, we use uh, node port services as a bridge between um, our smart stack service discovery system and Kubernetes. Uh, so that means that you can talk from services in uh, EC2 to services running in Kubernetes. You can talk between uh, different clusters. And that usually works great, right? So a little bit about node port services, right? Like when you, you hit the node port uh, on the, the instance, uh, hits IP tables, and it will rewrite from the node IP and the node port into the uh, pod IP and uh, the pod port. And uh, the important note here is that pod uh, A in this example is running on an overlay network. So it's a different IP space. Okay, so what happens if you have two pods of the same service and the traffic comes in again from the uh, node port IP uh, and node port port? So it hits IP tables and then it rewrites the IP and port and then it has to choose from two of these pods now. So how does it choose them? Well, there's, it uses essentially random allocation. And that's a problem for us um, because uh, you can't s spread load very evenly with uh, random load allocation. It's, uh, IP tables is it's not meant to be a, a load balancer. And also, if you have two pods on the same node and one pod on the other node, uh, they're likely to uh, have different traffic levels. So in the example of the service that I gave earlier, uh, some nodes, there were multiple pods, and then uh, others, there was a single pod. And so this is kind of the... Uh, pod co-location problem uh, that ends up with, with traffic imbalance. So did Kubernetes make my P95s worse? Uh, maybe. Uh, so traffic imbalance caused variable load and latency, but it certainly made uh, latencies more unpredictable. So some of the lessons are that um, when we first ran Kubernetes, first started migrating into it, uh, we were running an overlay network. So that provides a lot of flexibility, right? You have uh, you can do uh, infinite IPs, basically. You can have them running in the same uh, CIDR range. Uh, you can also add um, like network policy, uh, but that adds a lot of complications. Uh, and also, IP tables load balancing is it's not ideal, right? You don't have like round robin. Uh, you don't have like any other advanced load balancing strategies. Uh, so, so some alternatives uh, that you could use are using Envoy for for balancing between pod IPs. Um, you can also use uh, cloud provider uh, native IPs to avoid the overlay. Um, also, you can use uh, IPVS as your uh, Q proxy uh, proxier uh, if, it, if it works for you. Uh, we, we found some small open issues that um, caused us to stick with IP tables for now. But um, the one that we're most strongly considering moving towards is using the uh, cloud provider native IPs. Okay, now we'll talk about QPNS slowness. So here's another service uh, latency graph. So on May 10th, 
uh, everything was fine. Saw a couple of spikes in latency, maybe up to uh, like one second. And then it went to five seconds, and then uh, 20 seconds. Uh, so, and it stayed there uh, for quite a long time. And this was not unique to one service, right? So these are multiple graphs across multiple services, right? There's uh, high latency, elevated error rates, like failed health checks. Um, so what did these services have in common? They all relied heavily uh, on DNS and made a lot of uh, external DNS queries. So uh, this is, once we dug a little deeper, we uh, looked at kubeDNS load, right? And we saw that some kubeDNS pods had pretty high uh, QPS, and some pods had rather low QPS. So traffic imbalance strikes again. Uh, so let's talk about how kubeDNS works now. So let's say you're pod A running in uh, your node. You make a DNS request. Uh, again, it's going to hit IP tables. This time it's going to use the cluster IP of kubeDNS. And so it's going to balance across uh, multiple pods. And again, it's going to do so randomly. And so that causes a traffic imbalance. And then in this case, we hit the AWS uh, DNS packet per second limit. Uh, so that caused uh, slow latencies and uh, timeouts for multiple services. So did Kubernetes make my P95s worse? Yes. Uh, so the lessons are, uh, by default, kubeDNS is discovered through cluster IP. Uh, and you also, by default, your pods use DNS policy of cluster first, which reaches out to kubeDNS. So even if you're making like external DNS queries that, that aren't like the like within service uh, address uh, uh, URLs, then you're going to go through um, kubeDNS first. So if you don't need Kubernetes DNS resolution, you can set the pod DNS policy to uh, default or none if you want to do like further customization by like using uh, more fine-grained parameter tuning. All right, for the recap, uh, so let's tally up the scores. Uh, for latency is improved, uh, yeah, I would say Kubernetes did not make it better, did not make uh, the performance worse, uh, but take the credit if it improved, uh, because there's so many underlying systems that affect performance, like hardware, host, uh, OS, et cetera. Uh, and then noisy neighbor is like, yes, and some of the lessons are set your limits and be wary of how CPU is actually counted. Uh, uh, noisy neighbor is made worse by Kubernetes, like yes, uh, you should try to maybe like look into how uh, priorities and predicates are, are affecting how your pods are getting scheduled. And for uh, right once run anywhere, uh, let's say yes-ish. Like I, I would say more of this was because of the move to containers. Uh, they're just like gotchas when you move applications to a containerized uh, environment. And ideally you can just like fix it by upgrading your applications and languages to be uh, container aware. For traffic in imbalance, uh, maybe uh, be wary of IP tables load balancing. Again, uh, it's not a load balancer. Okay, uh, and then kube DNS slowness. Uh, did Kubernetes make my P95s worse? Yes, so check your DNS policy early and often. Uh, make sure you're using the right one for your use case. A few other takeaways. Uh, so, like, the overall message, right, is that performance includes tuning layers at all layers of the stack. Kubernetes has a lot of layers in the stack. Uh, there's host, cluster, like container, application, language, uh, network, a few others, right? And before you do your migration, uh, set the expectations that some small performance differences can happen. Um, as long as you have a baseline, right, you can measure to see exactly how much worse, how much better, um, just keep track and, and run side by side uh, for a little while and then fix any like major regressions that come up. We're also um, hiring, so uh, learn more at our Medium uh, Airbnb engineering blog posts or visit uh, airbnb.com slash careers. Thanks.